So welcome back to a special case study lecture on a class of indigenous microprocessors that is developed in our country. We have already learned about basic architectural features of unicore and multicore processors in this course. We have learned about the pipeline aspect, the storage aspect and the interconnect aspect. Now it is right time to understand a specific microprocessor under study and try to see what are the features that are there in correlation with the concepts that we have already learned. So this session is all about a walk through through the architectural features of Vega series of microprocessors. I hope this will give you a realistic touch to the concepts that you have learned and how the same concepts are being followed in the microprocessor manufacturing industry. So we are moving to introduction to Vega microprocessors and this is the brief outline that I plan today. We will introduce you to the concept of Digital India Risk 5 program and then briefly touch upon what do you mean by Risk 5 instruction set architecture and then we will learn about Vega series of processors and as a case study we will take up two microprocessors the Vega ET series and the Vega AS series two set of microprocessors and then we will learn about system on chip with the Vega processors used inside that and about the Aries development board system and the Vega ecosystem. To start with let me first introduce you about the Digital India RISC-V program. Over the last few years there is a huge impetus on Atmanirbhar Bharat program to develop products that the fellow countrymen in India want that the science and technology be driven to a product oriented approach that India can be self reliant. We all know that we spend lot of money in importing consumer electronics gadgets. So why can't we have an indigenous manufacturing ecosystem of semiconductor devices especially the microcontrollers and microprocessors which is acting as the brain of these consumer electronic gadgets be it laptops, cell phones, display devices, computing devices, storage devices etc. Everything that has a kind of microprocessor or a microcontroller inside that. So under the Ministry of Electronics and IT, indigenous microprocessor development program was been initiated and various projects are being funded under this category. Premier institutes like IITs, R&D labs like CDAC were entrusted with the responsibility of coming up with a roadmap for development of indigenous microprocessor for India. In this context, one such initiative which was spearheaded by the CDAC group, Center for Development of Advanced Computing under the Ministry of Electronics and IT. Over the years, good research was been done and processors were developed completely indigenous in India. So I thought it would be the right platform to discuss about one such microprocessor initiative. There are many such microprocessor initiative from IIT Madras as well as from IIT Bombay. We will discuss about that maybe in a subsequent lecture. Today our focus is specifically on one such initiative by the CDAC. So this Metis Digital India RISC-V microprocessor program which is also known as DAR-5 program. The overall aim is to enable creation of microprocessor for the future for India and for the world and achieve industry grade silicon and design wins by December 2023. We are heading on to that target. This program will make India not only a RISC-5 talent hub for the world but also a supplier of RISC-5 SOCs for servers, mobile devices, automotive, IoT and microcontrollers across the globe. So as part of this initiative, CDAC developed a series of microprocessors under the name Vega processors 
and they have successfully developed the Vega series of microprocessors and related IPs and the complete ecosystem was also been developed to enable fully indigenous product development that meets various requirements in the strategic industrial and commercial sectors. These high performance processors are based upon the open source RISC-V instruction set architecture. In our course, we have already learned about the RISC pipeline, the basic RISC pipeline, the five stage pipeline, an extension of that is called the RISC V ISA. So that is going to be the heart of the Vega microprocessors. Before moving into the features of Vega, let me quickly introduce you what is RISC V architecture. So RISC V instruction set architecture is a free ISA from University of California, Berkeley. It is based on the established risk principles, reduced instruction set computer, the load store architecture, which we already learned. And risk 5 ISA is provided under open source license so that we do not require a fee to use it. It also aims at development of semiconductor research and design and risk 5 merely offers the ISA only. So the designers are free to make any processor low cost embedded ones to high end supercomputers by making use of this risk 5 isa now coming into the vega class of processors we can see that there exist a wide range of processors moving from the vega et series all the way to vega as series and uh, let's quickly glance through the architectural features of them so when it comes to the vega et series it is a 32 bit single core processor with some specific set of the instructions like what you can see it is a RISC V 32 bit which will support integer operation and multiplication and division operation. It has a three stage pipeline and it follows an in order pipeline. We have already learned about the in order pipeline and out of order pipeline where execution can you rearrange the dynamic execution of instruction that is called out of order. Execution can be out of order and then completion and then we have commit stage. So the first series what we have seen here is the ET1031 processor. They are basically 32 bit processor and simple instruction like the integer instruction as well as the multiple multiplication and division operations and it follows a simple three stage in order pipeline. We look about this pipeline later, what are the various stages of it. Now we will see what this numbering indicates. So this stands for an embedded type of processor that is the E and it is a single core processor and this T stands for it is 32 bit processor and this 3 stands for the number of stages in the pipeline and the version 1. So if you look into the next one it is an application processor with 64 this S stands for 64 bit processor unicore 6 stage pipeline. So it is 64 bit single core processor and it provides few more set of instruction apart from basic integer and multiply division instruction it is providing atomic instruction single precision floating point double precision floating point as well as compression set of instruction it uses a six stage pipeline but still it is an in order pipeline when you move to the next one vega as1161 this also is application processor not like an embedded class what we have seen already 64 bit unicore but it has a 16 stage pipeline that is a basic difference once you move to 16 stage pipeline then you have out of order super scalar processing features that is available. Now we are moving into dual core everything else is same from AS1 series to AS2 series it is dual core 16 stage out of order super scalar pipeline the same set of instructions like integer multiplication division atomic single precision and double precision. And the last class is known as the Vega 4 core processors that is also using 16 stage pipeline and out of order. So if you can see that there exists a class of processors beginning from simple in order pipelines with 32 bit architecture moving all the way to 64 bit architecture and then slightly expanding to out of order processors, unicore out of order dual core out of order and quad core out of order. Let us now take the case of the Vega AS series processor like what it has been mentioned it is a application processor with 64 bit data width unicore and 6 stage pipeline. 
it support the risk 5 64 bit architecture with all standard class of instructions like what you can see it has an in order pipeline it has a branch predictor it has the translation look aside buffer since it supports floating point operation fd it has a floating point unit and then we have the caches the i caches the 8 kb i cache and d cache and a memory management unit so like what you have seen six stage in order pipeline implementation it has been done we will see the stages now you can use either 32 bit instruction or 16 bit instruction for better code density that is why we call it as a compressed instruction category. So, when you compress instruction 32 bit instruction will form 16 bit instructions and then we have a memory management unit and physical memory protection features and then we have for doing branch prediction operation we have a branch target buffer, a branch history table and a return address stack that is available and then 8 KB L1 I cache and D cache. We already told that this class of microprocessor is using a six stage pipeline. In our initial lectures, we have seen the basic five stage risk pipeline. One more stage has been added, it is basically at the beginning of it. Let us try to see what these various stages are. It is more or less simple to the kind of five stage pipeline that we have already learned. So, in the stage one, we have a PC calculation which is connected to the branch predictor, and once the PC has been calculated, it goes to the instruction TLB and then it goes to the I cache from which the fetching happened that is your stage number 2 and then you decode, you read the basic operands and then you have the execute unit which will take care of the address calculation for load and store instruction and if it is for other operation you actually carry out that and then for address calculation for load and store it goes to the data TLB and to the D cache from which the memory access takes place if it is a load or store instruction. And then we have the basic write back for control and status registers are also being updated based upon the end product of uh, the result of the operation. And for communicating to the other IOs, we have the AXI interface that is being supported. So, when you look at this pipeline, it is more or less same as the traditional risk pipeline that we learned, the basic five stage risk pipeline. This also forms a load store architecture. It has a PC calculation that is being directly linked to the branch predictor and followed by that you have the TLBs which will convert the virtual address to the physical address and you access the I cache from where the fetching happens, decode and then go to the execution stage unit where we know that if it is a load store instruction you calculate the address for other operations you perform the task in the ALU and then you go to the data memory access the mem stage and followed by the write back stage. Now, like what is already been told this Vega class uh, is has the capability to boot Linux and other operating system and the pipeline is highly configurable and supports the kind of instruction that I already mentioned their extensions. The processor is connected to the rest of the memory system and I O through a high performance AXI interface. Let us now look into the pipeline stages the first stage is the PC calculation stage and this stage generates the next PC. So, how do you compute the next PC? It can be either as the subsequent instruction if it is a linear flow of instructions or if it is a branch instruction then the address has to be obtained based upon the input from the branch predictor module. And the branch predictor module has a branch target buffer which will tell you what is the address to which you have to jump and some branch history what happened to these branches in this previous iteration. And if you go to any kind of uh, subroutine, then how do you come back? The return address stack for highly accurate branch prediction. So, the PC whatever is being generated, there are two ways in which you are going to generate the PC. The first way is if it is a sequential flow of program, then the PC is being incremented regularly like PC equal to PC plus X. In this case, PC plus 4, we are using a 32 bit instruction or PC plus 8 if it is a 64 bit instruction as the case may be. So, that is called the linear sequencing. If there is a branch, then the branch predictor will give you what is the address. So, whatever be the case, the PC is been updated as here by the linear sequencing fashion or by the branch predictor. This is all what happened in the very first stage. Now, if you look into the fetch stage, the instruction cache is virtually indexed and physically tagged with a single cycle hit latency. So, we generally call it as VIPT caches 
we all know that when you have uh, the address that is been coming, we have the tag, the index and the offset. So, the first step operation is called the indexing. So, what you do is with the with the indexing you go into the cache. So, before translation we are going to virtually index with virtual is the bits that is available in the virtual address you go and index. In the meantime once you extract the tag the TLB translation happens so that the physical tag bits are available. So, we call it as virtually index physically tag the cache and the response from the cache is being sent to the fetch stage and then to the decode stage. Sometimes we use 16 bits to compress the instruction then the data received from the cache can be a combination of compressed as well as non compressed instruction. So, like since this particular class of processor support both compressed 16 bit instruction as well as uncompressed. So, looking into the kind of instruction sometimes you may have to uncompress them and process sometimes you have to process them directly. So, depending upon the class of instruction appropriate operation has to be done before decoding. Now, we move into the decode stage. So, whatever instruction that is been supplied by the fetch unit the instruction decode unit ensures the operand for the execution units are available. So, sometimes the operands are available in the register file for basic arithmetic and logic operation. Sometimes you may need to calculate the immediate values and sometimes you need to check for illegal opcodes as well. And so, accordingly once you get the opcodes you try to see whether they are legal opcodes and then go for the operands from the register file and accordingly you generate a packet which has to be supplied to the execution unit. So, in the decode stage once you get the operands you create it with the opcode and the corresponding operand values and then you supply it together to the execution unit. So, we generally call it as the packet that is being supplied because it is a bundle the bundle consists of the corresponding opcode that has to be signaled upon using the execution stage and a set of operand values that are been available. Sometimes operand values are read from the register file, sometimes operand values are already available part of the instruction as an immediate value. Now, the core also includes the 32, 32 bit integer general purpose register. So, total count is 32 registers available and each register can store a 32 bit integer value and then we have machine supervisor and user mode control that is available we have status register. So, your register file consists of the general purpose registers and associated with it the special control registers. So, if the floating point operation is enabled then we have another 32 floating point registers also available. So, we have 32 integer registers and 32 floating point registers from which the operands are being fetched. We have multiple read ports and we have a register bypassing mechanism that is available if at all we wanted to reduce the stalls. Now, coming into the execution stage, the execute stage also support configurable IMA FDC architectures. It performs the required operation on the data provided by the instruction decode stage. So, whatever is the operation that is being identified by the decode stage, it is being passed on with the appropriate triggering of the control signal and execution unit carry out the operation. It has multiple execution units each with a unique function. It can have adder, it can have multiplier, it can have divider like that. The ALU performs logical and arithmetic operation like what we know. The multiplier unit performs signed and unsigned multiplication operation and the divider unit will perform signed and unsigned division operation also. We have a separate floating point operation unit as well and then we have the load store unit which access the data memory. So, the branch unit which is part of the execution unit calculates a jump and the branch addresses and validates the predicted branches. So, what is being told the execution unit itself consists of different subunits inside that it can be adder subtractor, it can be multiplier, it can be divider, it can be load store unit which will compute the effective address and sometimes it is the branch unit also which will calculate the branch address. And then we support the floating point operation here. So, we have single precision as well as double precision computation also can be done. So, as per IEEE 758 standard this floating point operation is also been carried out. So, if it is a floating point operation then appropriate control signal is being generated to the floating point unit to carry out the task. Only one operation can be executed per clock cycle and most operation of the execution unit completes in one clock cycle except the floating point operations. 
Now coming into the next stage, we have the memory stage. The memory access stage waits for a memory read access to complete. So when memory is accessed, the address, data and control signals are calculated in the previous stage. Since it is a load store architecture, we know that we have load and store instruction that is going to touch the memory. So in that case, the address has to be computed. The address is not available a priori in the instruction from a base register and from a displacement. The address is computed in the load store unit and this address is been fed to the data TLB and it will provide the corresponding value and that is being used to index into the data memory and return the corresponding word. The memory latches these signals and perform the actual access and the memory stage access is making use of a data TLB to convert from virtual to physical translation. The data cache is physically indexed and physically tied because you go to TLB only from the output of TLB you are going to index. So the difference between in the case of an ITLB there we are using virtually indexed and physically tagged cache. So first you perform indexing in the meantime pass it through the ITLB and get the physical values whereas your data TLB is physically indexed and physically tagged that means you go to the data TLB first and then the result that is coming out is used for indexing the dcache. So data TLB's output is given to dcache whereas in the previous case of the fetching a part of uh, the address is directly going for indexing operation. In the meantime the ITLB converts into the physical address from the virtual address and then you accordingly perform the physical tagging but it is virtually indexed. Now coming to the write back stage as you know it is the last stage write back stage is responsible for completing an instruction execution by writing back the execution results to general purpose register and the control and status register file and CSR instruction execution is also done in the write back stage and other responsibilities specifically include handling of exceptions, interrupt processing, debugging and trigger processing. So these all been carried out at the last stage. So with this we, we have gone through what are the various sub stages that are been involved in a conventional RISC-V pipeline that is been used in the Vega processor. So we know that right from PC calculation to fetching to decoding to execution to memory access and as well as to the write back the various flow that is been involved. Now we look into what are the operating modes. We have the first mode of operation for the Vega process that is a debug mode. This is the highest privilege level of operation and when we use it we are going to use it only for software development and debug stage so that during this mode it is a very slow mode we have access to all features of the core I can see the register value I can see the control and status registers at every point I can stop execution or temporarily suspend execution and watch. The other one is the high performance mode that is the machine mode of operation this is the highest mode of software execution and it is mandatory in all the RISC-V processors and then we have the supervisor mode this is typically used for providing isolation between a supervisor level operating system and the user execution environment and the last category specifically for user the lowest privilege mode of operation with the user application executed in this mode. So we can see that right from the debug mode to the machine mode to supervisor mode and to user mode we have four class of operating modes that is being supported and depending upon the kind of environment that you want we can configure into one of these four modes and carry out the execution. Now we look into the first category that is a Vega ET series like what it is told it belongs to the embedded class it is a 32 bit processor it has single core and three stage pipeline. So it supports 32 bit IM instruction set only the integer and the multiplication operation it does not have a floating point unit inside it. So it is a 32 bit risk 5 with integer and multiplication operation multiplication mean multiplication operation series are only available in order pipeline that you have and then it uses basically the Harvard architecture perform multiplication and division unit has been mentioned and it supports vectored interrupts like you know when an interrupt is being supplied if the device that initiates the interrupt will give a number which will help the processor to understand which interrupt service routine is to be executed that is why we call it as a vectored interrupt and we have a configurable external interface that is been available through which you can connect to the memory the other higher levels of memory as well as the peripheral ports. What we learned till now is about the internal architecture and features of a microprocessor. Now we know that even if you 
open up your computer or a laptop it is not only a microprocessor there should be an ecosystem in which this microprocessor sits we call it as the board so we need a system on chip wherein this microprocessor is fitted and the ram is been connected so various other gadgets other memory and io peripheral devices everything is been connected which is seamlessly integrated to this microprocessor so now we learn once the processor is ready with only the processor alone we cannot do the task so we have an soc board so tejas 32 is the first vega microprocessor based soc so we have this tejas micro tejas setup that is the soc that is been available so this tejas 32 is an soc which has the vega microprocessor inside that so we can see that this is the soc block diagram a risk 5 32 bit risk 5 cpu is there and then you can see that you have uart you have the spis you have the timers the ram interrupt controllers i square c ports general purpose io ports and pwm ports that are been available so we have this stage 64 also so when you replace this 32 bit processor of vega with a 64 bit version then we call it as stage 64 So this has been already been done. The Tejas 32 is already been done, and it has been in practice. The others are already in the pipeline. Especially this one is also completed. And then we have the Druv 64. This is a board, the framework that has been used, an SOC framework which has a 64-bit dual-core SOC. And then your Dynus 64 and Dynus 64 Plus are using quad-core SOCs. So Tejas is basically for unicore, Druv is for dual core, and Dhanush is for quad core. And there are two variants of Dhanush, depending upon the features that is been supported. So we are now knowing about, like along with the microprocessor, you need to have a board and SOC with other peripherals, higher levels of memory that are being integrated together. So what will be this chip contained? it contains the various connectivity the data path from the microprocessor to all these peripheral units as well as to the memory unit so that your program can be embedded in the memory and then the fetching happens across the memory hierarchy and then it reaches processor decodes and execution unit is triggering the operations and then you can see the outputs let's say in a display screen or if it has to be taken to some other device now if you look into the tejas 32 soc it is making use of a processor which is the vega et series processor you have 256 kb ram so it can be used typically for small embedded application very small capacity of ram three uarts are there four spis are there serial peripheral interface we have timers which is used for carrying out specific activity which need to be interrupted at regular timings eight set of pwms three numbers of i square c ports 32 general purpose io ports it is operating at a core voltage of 1.2 volt and the io voltage is 3.3 volt and then we have to see that the frequency maximum supported frequency is 125 megahertz now what are the kind of application that we can use since we know that it is going to operate at a very low frequency with a limited ram this cannot be used for laptops or heavy and computing device or cell phones it can be used for small embedded applications what are the kind of application something like sensor fusions using in smart fitters supervising system supervisors in remote sensing application very small iot devices which has programs which can be fitted into this size on small wearable devices which will sense and give some kind of minor processing small toys and electronic equipments special legacy 8 bit or 16 bit application and for industrial networking and many more class like that now you can see that your tejas soc is here which has all the thing integrated into it and now this is going to fit in inside the development platform so this is the aries development platform which will provide the right set of interface how to connect your various gadgets we have pins buses and then we have ports through which you can connect and then the power supply can be given so this soc is been kept on an aries development board platform which we have already seen and then we have a micro development platform also if you look at the previous one this is the normal development platform little bigger in size we have a smaller version of that also which is known as the micro development platform it's also kind of almost the same 
it has a little bit of flash memory that has been available here and some ADCs are available and the IO ports will slightly vary in terms of numbers what like what we had previously like if you look into we have 32 number of IO ports when it comes to the normal ADCs and then here we have little lesser number of IO because you have to reduce the overall physical size of it. So, some, some changes will be there with respect to the peripheral devices and the range of numbers that we can connect. So, you can see this Aries micro. Now, the whole ecosystem, how do you learn about the Vega processors? So, since it is been funded by the central government project, all the resources are available for you to work on and then have some kind of a hands on that is available. Very simple, it is an eclipse based IDE that is available and then you can free Artos, Linux, Sapphire, Fedora, Debian, any operating system can be used. We have Linux based device drivers available, board support packages are there. Many libraries for different IoT applications are already kept there, compiler tools are there, good discussion forum, documentation and tutorial videos are available. So, where will you get all these from? So, you can refer to the Vega processor website and there is a specific YouTube channel for them and the Aries development platform is there which has the, about the various development boards and its features. A detailed user manual is been there, there is a git repository where which you can find out the other codes and then to know more about that we have the Vega blog also that is been available. So, in today's small lecture we were trying to see about a specific class of microprocessors and its internal features plus the development setup and the ecosystem for you to work on. What our country wants is in the next couple of years where we are going to become a semiconductor manufacturing hub, especially development of these processors, indigenous development and manufacturing of these processors so that we can make use of our own products like Atmanur Bharata without depending on other semiconductor giant companies to supply us. So, we want large talent pool of budding engineers and researchers who have some familiarity with at least one of these kind of indigenous processors and it is working and small application development with these processor series so that you all will become industry ready. In my assessment in the next half to one decade, there is lot of requirement of trained manpower in this domain. So, I seriously urge you to have some kind of familiarity and then uh, feel free to make use of these resources such that you will also be exposed to the latest development that is been happening in our country. So, let us all put our hands together in making sure that the indigenous microprocessor development program we can also support in our own ways and we can also be equipped with the state of art facilities. Thank you.